Welcome to the ASA podcast, where we focus on subcontractors, the construction industry, and the issues and people making an impact. The ASA podcast is brought to you by the American Subcontractors Association and the foundation of the American Subcontractors Association. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the ASA podcast. I'm your host, Mike Klein, with ASA National. Today, I've got Shannon Oscar with me, as well as Eric Travers. Uh, They are representing the SLDF and the ASA Attorneys Council. Um, Welcome, you guys. Why don't you introduce yourselves uh, so people know who they're listening to? Shannon, you have the honors. (laughs) Thank you, Mike. I'm Shannon Oscar. I work with ASA National, and I am the managing director for our Attorneys Council and task forces. Um, So I handle issues um, with the Subcontractor Legal Defense Fund and our contract documents workforce, as well as um, as well as our government relations. And happy to be here today. Uh, and my my name is Eric Travers. I'm with the uh, law firm of Kegler, Brown, Hill, and Ritter. Um, we have been general counsel to uh, ASA for um, well over uh, a decade now, uh, 15 plus years. Uh, and one of the roles that that we have is uh, is handling intake and looking at cases that come in for ASA, uh, the subcontractors legal defense fund. So that's, that's why I'm here today too, and also happy to be here. Well, thank you both for joining us today. Um, The purpose of this episode is really to get ASA members and potential ASA members to understand what the Subcontractors Legal Defense Fund is, uh, as well as the Attorneys Council and why it's so important uh, to ASA as a benefit. So I have a series of questions that I'm going to ask and uh, answer however you you wish. Um, I'm sure it's going to be great information. So uh, first question I have for you. Uh, and feel free to answer in in uh, whoever has the best answer, or you can co-answer. However you want to do it is fine by me. Could you briefly explain the role of the American Subcontractors Association and how the Subcontractor Legal Defense Fund fits into its broader mission? Yeah, I, I, I can certainly address that. The American Subcontractors Association is a national alliance of construction, subcontracting, and affiliated ent- entities that um, are organized to promote our interests. Um, so we, we do that in government and industry. We provide educational opportunities for our members, and we offer a platform for business networking and outreach in the construction industry. The Subcontractor Legal Defense Fund, which was founded in 97, was established to provide legal support for precedent-setting cases that directly impact subcontractors. These cases involve some of the top issues that that impact subcontractors in construction, such as paid laws, lien and bond claims, insurance and liability matters, and we have cases that have touched on all of these throughout the years. Um, The presence of a national association with the prominence of ASA in these cases um, does carry weight in the courts. And so that's why we're here and and doing what we do. Uh, Eric, anything to add? I got nothing to add. That was great. All right. So uh, (laughs) what what kicked it off? What was the reason that uh, that ASA wanted to create the, the SLDF? Eric might have been around for more or more of that than I was because yeah, well, it, it it predates me. <laughs> yeah, no, this goes back a ways, and and I mean, years and and years and years ago. And I, I think I think what happened was there was a recognition by ASA at that time and the people in charge uh, that there's there's a bit of a void um, that needed to be filled by something like um, the Subcontractors Legal Defense Fund because all the hard work that goes into lobbying and getting good laws passed um, that protect subcontractors' rights um, on on things like mechanics liens and prompt pay act and um, limitations or invalidation of things like pay if paid clauses and that. All, all that can be for naught if you get a court that doesn't understand it or that issues a decision that then becomes precedent and then relied upon and things can trickle down so what you need is you need to have kind of it's like the hammer and the nail right the 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 nail could be the statute that's as good as it is but until the court hammers it into the wood of the law 
Um, you've got this potential for um, for good laws to go unused, for good laws to be misinterpreted, for bad laws to be created um, by decisions that arise either out of um, out of uh, a court that doesn't really understand or poor lawyering. Uh, or just bad facts that that sometimes you know uh, bad facts can lead to results that might be okay, but uh, in the context of the parties that were involved in it, but that is pretty terrible if it's used as the basis to then deny someone uh, a right or to enforce uh, a contract provision that um, that shouldn't be uh, otherwise. So. So I think what happened was the the ASA wound up deciding that to fill that void, the, they would create the subcontractor's legal defense fund, um, and that would help um, get us involved, have ASA have a seat at the table for its membership in these cases of precedential value. And by precedential value, we mean it's a case that the courts below it have to enforce, or that is of persuasive, if it's not in that, that state, it's of persuasive reasoning and value. So when that same issue comes up in a different state and perhaps under a different law, you can have some solid reasoning or case law that you can point to. Um, and because whether it's a pay if paid enforceability or payment bond or mechanics lien rights or an insurance applicability, um, you know, in the context of a construction project, those issues occur and reoccur from, from state to state. And the funds that are spent on SLDF cases where, uh, the, you know, an amicus brief amicus means friend of the court, um, ASA enters in and they, as a friend of the court, give them our take on why a particular result makes sense uh, and is right and equitable and is the proper interpretation of the law from our perspective and how, because, and how it impacts things down the line. Because most trial courts those aren't precedent, right? That's where the the, the 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 original decision comes. That court, whether it's a jury or a judge, is trying to enforce and come to the right decision for the parties there based on the agreement they struck, which is the contract, and and uh, whether that all the provisions of the contract are enforceable. It the appellate courts though now have to start thinking about how does this impact because those are precedential. How does this impact others down the road? And so when you've got a case that we can enter an amicus appearance in and have the say from the perspective of the subcontractor community, the money that gets spent on the donation that becomes the funds to fund that amicus effort allows us to punch above our weight, so to speak, um, in the cases and then have uh, an outsized influence beyond what that dollar might otherwise have spent on yourself or on uh, or on some other effort. Um, so the SLDF fund exists. It fills a nice niche. It really does set ASA apart. There's, you know, the, the the fact that ASA has an SLDF fund really goes to show how far thinking and far reaching and global um, of an influence ASA approaches these things and advocating for its members, because we're not just solely focused on contract clauses here or lobbying there, but on taking a, a holistic effect that you know, over the years, we've certainly seen some tremendous results. And even if you don't get the result that you would like in a particular case, that then becomes a basis that, that the lobbying effort can have more impact because you can go to the state center or the, or the federal center or, or uh, members of, rep, uh, of Congress uh, in your state and say, this result is terrible. And look, the court enforced it because it said this law mandates it. That can't possibly right. be right. So everything kind of builds it together. And that that fund and its creation has been integral, I think, in setting ASA apart as uh, as really one of the premier trade associations in, in the country in terms of how it advances and, and goes about uh, representing its members. Hmm. That's So is it, how is it different from a traditional legal aid service for contractors or is it the uh, same no it's 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 different so uh, so traditional legal aid services um are services that provide assistance to parties that that might not otherwise be able to pay for it or might need assistance in paying for uh, legal representation or access to the courts at least that's the typical understanding of it that's not what sldf is because 
you know, and sometimes we do get parties that reach out and say, hey, I'm embroiled in a dispute. I need some money to pay my attorneys. That's not what we are, unfortunately. We, you know, the, the money would disappear really quickly because there's all sorts of um, dispute uh, or people need help paying their attorneys. Um, and so that's the traditional legal aid kind of goes to aid to help fund people represent themselves or pursue a recovery. Whereas um, the SLDF money is money that is donated with the understanding and then with a set of guardrails in place um, as to how it's used and what cases the 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 ASA will enter these amicus appearances in to make sure that that money is spent on cases that have broader impact beyond just the parties right. themselves uh, to the dispute or the party that's asking for assistance. Right. Okay. Shannon, anything to add to that? No. Yeah, that's a, it's it's absolutely correct, and that's a, as Eric said. That's why we we only take on those appellate cases that are going to have a precedent setting effect on these issues. Um, so so that we we have we have it set up that way for a reason. It's been through years of of trial and error, I think, and and experience with these with these kind of cases, and and the way that we take them on, we've we've found a great deal of success. So, what are some of the most common legal issues. I, you mentioned a couple already um, yeah. in previous answers, but what are the most some of the most common that, that subcontractors are facing these days, and how does SLDF approach those? Yeah, and I would I would just say overall, you know, the the number one issues revolve around payment issues, whether it's dealing with clients or insurers, lien and bond holders. Um, we we dealt with contractor liability on on construction sites, uh, but but I, I would say the core issues, and I've, and Eric could probably go into much greater detail on this than me, but the core issues are around um, on on getting paid for the work that our subcontractors are doing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, you've got, and everything sort of flows for the most part from that, right? Um, and so whether it's a, whether it's a lien and bond, whether it's when do you have to pay? When do you have a right to be paid? You know, construction is one of those weird uh, in in the industry or in the in the economy, um, you know, uh, professions where you're essentially doing work on credit if you're a subcontractor, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because you're providing the labor materials now in the hopes that you get paid later. And when you're a sub, you apply to the general and generally the general is going to have something built in that, well, you don't get paid until it gets paid. And, and it will try to make that pay if paid. Some of that's in unenforceable, thanks in part to ASA's lobbying and the SLDF efforts in certain states. Sometimes it's enforceable. Other times it's, you know, they at least want the right to get paid from the owner. So that means you're starting to look at payment delays. So if you're a, if you're a sub, you've got to pay your employees, right? Biweekly or weekly, you've got to pay your suppliers, you know, within 30 days. And, you know, there, there's all sorts of, you got to pay for your rentals, your everything you have, you have to pay pretty much almost immediately, but then you don't get paid until someone else has looked for, decided whether or not you did a good enough job or whether you actually reached that. And so everything trickles down and then you have a contractual framework that has developed over the years um, where generals, uh, you know, the upper tiers tend to want to push off having to pay as long as they can and sometimes right. trying to tie that to whether or not they've been paid. And meanwhile, you know, that's that winds up driving your mechanics lien rights. Can you enforce them? Do you have them or did you waive them? You know, are you entitled to payment? What sort of payment? You know, do you have bond claims that flow from that? Um, what's your liability? I mean, all that stuff at its core tends to come down to payment rights, or or that's where it that's where it originates, regardless of what the actual issue is that you're that you're talking about. And and you know, and sometimes it's do you have insurance to pay for this liability, right? <laughs> uh, and 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 whether or not the uh, insurance company has an obligation to cover uh, the damage or not. It's uh, you, you hear it so often, um, and I was struck by that uh, when I first started working with ASA, um, how big of an issue it is, and it's it really 
there's a threat of, of payment and problems with payment through so much that we that we tackle here today say so it really is really is amazing i'll be honest with you yeah um, <laughs> so can you walk us through the process how would a, how does a subcontractor access support from the legal defense fund mm -hmm. Uh, we we have a process that we've really, as I mentioned earlier, I think honed through the years to then ensure that we're wisely allocating the funds that we work so hard to raise for the SLDF. That process begins with an application for support that outlines the details of the case. And that application comes to me at ASA and Eric Travers and his team at Kegler Brown for review. Um, the factors and considerations for involvement include alignment with subcontractor interests nationally, clearly focused case issues, and whether it could have a meaningful impact on judicial proceedings moving forward. Um, importantly, ASA will not will only intervene in appellate cases where the applicant has agreed not to settle before the um, before the court issues a verdict, so that when so that when we're going in and lending the weight of 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 ASA to this issue that it's that it's not something that settles out, outside of court and and doesn't set the precedent that we're that we're looking to set. Um, gotcha. All the information about the application process uh, is laid out on our website on our asaonline.com. If you go under advocacy and then SLDF is one of the subheadings there, we have a more detailed list of, of the process and, um, and the factors for consideration that everyone can look at to see if they have a case that we, we might be able to support. Yeah. And, you know, and with regard to what Shannon mentioned about, um, you know, that what, there's limited funds, right? And so there, there, and this gets back to the guardrails that I said are in place when we analyze a case when it comes in as to whether it meets criteria or what of the criteria that have been set forth it meets. So when the task force votes and the task force consists of ASA members, right, um, that they can decide, okay, it, maybe it doesn't do this, but it does that, and it does enough of them that that let's let's spend the money to to enter the appearance. But it is very important. The ASA did get burned in the early years a couple times by huh. putting the money into funding a brief that the, the other party then used to, you know, the, the sub then used to leverage to get a, a good settlement, which huh. great for it. <laughs> Not so great for the people that donated money to to get a, a case. And again, we obviously want a case that that rules in our favor what we want but even if it doesn't there's value there so if you've got a settlement that undercuts it and you're left with a non-precedential trial court decision or something on appeal then um mm -hmm. people have have donated money uh to help subs and to help fund the the sldf mission and that gets undercut for the for you know for for the narrow self-interest of of the single party to that dispute and so that's why that's Part of what goes into what what Shannon mentioned is is a pretty well refined and articulated set of um, standards and concerns and uh, things that that um, the task force considers um, when when someone is is seeking assistance. Okay, so um, you, you mentioned it's got to be a precedent set, setting appellate case. The, uh, the 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 contractor who is requesting has to agree to not settle. They have to agree to, um, you know, let, let, let ASA, um, what was the word you used? Um, drawing a blank here all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> you're, you have to make your the amicus brief, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So when we ASA enters the the front of the court brief, and then the agreement is that the court renders a decision that the that the uh, applicant doesn't settle out of court. So what as you know, as Eric outlined, what we what we want is is a court precedent on the case, whether it's good or bad, because as he as he mentioned, even even the ones that don't go in our favor help us legislatively um, when we're taking those to our to our legislative bodies at the state level or at the federal level to say the courts decided in this case based on what you said. And so we need you to fix this. So oh. um, we can we, we can use them either way, but we just have we have to have a final decision on it. And and if it's um, if it's an applicant that that 
settles out of court, then obviously we don't get that that right. court decision. Yeah, and and that gets to you know I, I think what what you know when when there's the criteria or what it said the guardrails that are up you know it includes is it of precedential value right it, it, have they agreed to you know to to indemnify if if they decide to you know to settle like what are the likelihood of settlement because if if it's if it's high mm-hmm. we're not going to spend the donated funds on that you know right. um another one is is the issue of specific interest to construction subcontractors and suppliers right that doesn't mean that if there's an issue of broader interest that they won't get in, involved it just means that if their issue is of specific interest we do we do ask and and it's what the task force considers so take for example you know let's say a workers comp or an osha type claim or something that might be of definitely of interest to them but also of interest to a lot of others as long as it's of an interest that's good but compare that to if you have the same uh you know a, a payment bond or a lien dispute or a pay of paid provision that's going to be at a higher level because it's of specific mm-hmm. interest it actually ticks okay. that box it's not just of general interest to the community or to employers or to companies as a whole but does it fit? Is it construction specific? Because if because if it's of broader interest, that's great. But if it's of construction specific interest, well, now all of a sudden, who is going to stand up for subs and suppliers and for that interest, if not us? Because there's nobody. Right. Where you might have the Chamber of Congress, Commerce, or someone, you know, in, mm-hmm. in, in getting involved in those other cases. You might have owners getting involved if it's an insurance case. But it's just it's one of those uh, an example of those type of um, factors that gets. Um, that gets that gets figured into what we're doing. Um, some of the other issues, right? Is the issue focused and clearly presented? Um, you know, if it's not, if the underlying, so what we ask for the underlying decisions, right? When we get these, we ask for some of the pleadings. What's the other side saying? What's the actual decision? We don't just want to get the judgment entry that says you lost or you won on the other side's appeal, right? right? We want to see why or what what went into it because maybe you lost because your attorney forgot to preserve an objection, right? And as terrible as the decision or as inequitable as it might be, if there's a waiver issue of, of some right, we're not going to get involved because that issue that we care about is not likely to be focused and present clearly presented to the court, right? That's that's ruling on it. And, and that also gets to another is- issue we have to consider, which is whether the proceeding is likely to favor to set favorable or unfavorable precedent. So to use that other example, right? right. If the precedent it sets is just reinforcement of you can't waive things at trial by not raising them timely, well, that's <laughs> not, really, yeah. <laughs> not really what we're, you know, we're concerned about the fact that maybe in that same situation it resulted in you not having a lien claim that you should have right. had otherwise. But as much as we might agree with you on the lien claim, if the basis for that decision, and it looks like there's a compelling argument, is waiver or some other basis right they found that your witnesses weren't credible and there's an express finding of that right um it becomes much less likely that the sldf is good is going to enter um you know but again that's it that's that's part of the winnowing down and and making sure that um that we have it another one is another factor right criteria is um, is there likely to be consensus among asa members on that issue and that's important because you know, ASA has got subcontractor members across the nation. Right. Some are union, some are non-union, you know, some do work here, some do work there. And, you know, if it's a union issue, collective bargaining, we're not going to touch it as a general rule because we don't want to yeah. get involved on something that's going to annoy or or be adverse to the interest of a, a significant percentage, even if it's a minority percentage of uh, of ASA members. So, you know, again, there's a there's a list. There's like seven specific things that we look at. Uh, and the 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 intent is by the time the task force is voting on whether or not this is a case they want to enter, they've got a well defined. You know what? The issue is focused. It's clearly presented. There's consensus. 
it's not construction specific, but it's specific enough that pretty much all of our members are on board with it, which would be a workers comp or an OSHA type, you know, so again, they're going to have and they're going to be like, well, but this isn't a precedential value. That's a that's a that's a headshot, right, to a case. Some of them are just, well, it's a demerit uh, in terms of, uh, whether it's, it's, it ticks all seven, uh, others are huge. The, the, um, and so you go through those criteria and at the end of the day, then there's a vote, um, on it by the task force and the decision is made whether or not to, to go, um, you know, uh, based on how those evaluation criteria, uh, play out. How long does that take for you guys to come to a decision? It usually depends on on the particular case. There's we 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 tend to get these cases with some kind of a timeline. Um, we in terms of the courts and when the court needs the amicus brief filed by. Um, but generally speaking, um, we've 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 turned them around within within a week to probably oh, wow. two okay. weeks is is the most I've I've, I've seen that process take because. Um, we often get them at the timely stage, I would say. <laughs> and so we're, we're kind of, we're, we're getting everyone on a call. And, um, and, uh, and then again, like I said, the Kegler Brown team is reviewing it. They're writing a, a summary brief for our attorneys and the attorneys council and the SLDF task force to review the task force votes on it. And then it goes to our executive committee at ASA for final approval. Yeah. And then after that point um, is is when we put out the RFPs for um, for uh, amicus support for for the for the attorneys and and the law firms to um, to provide the um, to provide the amicus briefs for us. Mm. Yeah, and so just in that regard, right when that application comes in, and ASA has a <clears throat> has you know a link on the website with the form, our ability to turn it around depends on a lot of things you know the complexity of the issues also the information mm-hmm. that we're given uh we you know it, it needs to be complete enough and and not so convoluted that it takes 15 hours to to go mm-hmm. through because at this point we're you know like you know we need to have the underlying decisions that needs to be part of it if not you're going to get asked for it right if you dodge the question on settlement possibilities and indemnity, mm-hmm. um, you're you, you're going to get ta- asked about it, and that's just yeah. sense, right. And so, and, and at some point, we might just say, you know what, it's 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 too much. There's there's other cases out there where we're getting enough information because you know we need mm-hmm. to. We need to be given the tools that we can look at right. and the analysis can be made. So then when when the task force and the attorney's council is having it say that um, that it's not left asking a whole bunch of questions or that we're not left thinking, you know what, um, we don't know enough here because there is a, a huge fiduciary duty that is felt um, to be used to spend these funds wisely um, to make sure that that because there is such bang for the buck that you get when you enter these cases that that you're not um you're not spending it unwisely um and that that the case has been considered yeah makes sense well let's talk about how the sldf is funded and how the funding model impacts operations mm-hmm. so sldf is funded entirely through the generous support of our asa members and and sponsors. Um, we host annual events and have periodic solicitations just to remind the community of the important work that is being accomplished by the fund. Um, we're always grateful for those that recognize that work and financially support our efforts. So uh, it, it really is just just through the the generosity of our members that this that this fund exists. That's uh so it's there's no grants or anything. It's all donations. And- no, we don't. Yeah, mm-hmm. we do not get we do not get funding from any outside mm-hmm. sources. Yeah, and and, you know, and and if you're in a state, right, uh, and there's plenty of them where you're you you're the beneficiary, um, then please consider donating and earmarking it for SLDF because that that is how mm-hmm. they that is how the fund operate. I mean, it's a fund. 
yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, that that comes in and you know, the money is used wisely. But there there are, you know, there's plenty of states and plenty of cases out there where where people are the beneficiaries. And it's not just a state thing, right? Because if an issue comes in and it's purely state specific, it's that's not going to be of interest to the ASA membership as a whole, right? So right. things like mechanics lien laws are very state specific. The interpretation of them, is it going to be broadly construed and interpreted to, to provide security? Um, that impacts everybody, right? Payment bond lights, whether a pay if paid or how long is a reasonable period of time? Because even, you know, in a payment provision, a pay when paid, which is what um, the AIA and the consensus docs have, right? The industry forms have, which is pretty good. It, it's, but it, they tend to say you'll get paid within, a re, you know, seven days or a reasonable time after the, oh, the, you're the upper tiers and been paid by the owner. What's a reasonable time, right? There's a case in California, Crosno, um, just from a couple of years ago that ASA entered a, a case uh, and an appearance in that they said, well, uh, I, uh, in terms of payment bond rights, um, you know, you can't wait until the general has pursued the litigation and exhausted its remedies against the, the owner to be able to enforce your payment bond rights. The reasonable time expires. Uh, yeah. You know, which is a great decision for them, right? And that's a case where it's, yeah, it's California, but that issue comes up and people use it and they float it and they can leverage it against securities, whether you're in Alaska or Oklahoma or Ohio or New Hampshire, right? Uh, because the reasoning is there and the issue is there. And so, you know, that's the type of thing that um, that makes a lot of impact. And, you know, if you're if you're in the position that your business has has money that it's looking to, to, to donate or willing to to try to recognize these efforts and do good for the subcontracting community, um, then then checking out and, and you're marking a donation to the fund is really important because it allows us to enter in more cases, right? And and to, to the point that Shannon was talking about, we use local council in the states to write these amicus briefs because they're the, you know, out of the ASA members um that are that are council. So it's not just I'm not writing briefs uh in all these cases. I'm not licensed in these states. Um, you know, and it's the cases in in Texas, we're going to try to find Texas counsel, right? If it's in Oklahoma, we're going to look for Oklahoma, or at least people that are licensed there, um, you know. And so it's it's the the only self interest here is in trying to help the the SLDF maximize its uh, its ability to to have the funds to not only do its mission but to expand that mission and get involved more because um it's it's really a, a great thing for subcontractors to have an active sldf and, and unique to asa yeah yeah can you share a success story or uh let's say a particularly impactful case that the sldf has been involved with yeah uh i mean there there's there's a lot. I know there's, there's probably a lot, right? <laughs> uh, but it's but it's great, right? And across a range of issues. Um, so you know, we 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 had a um, we had a case. Um, so I actually did write the brief in in, in this particular mm -hmm. one because I you know I went uh, I was licensed and practiced in uh, Washington D.C. Maryland. I was licensed I practiced in the D.C. area in Virginia and Maryland and. In Maryland, there was a case called Questar Buildings versus QB Flooring, and basically, what that happened was whether you can terminate whether what whether the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing applies to a termination for convenience clause. In that particular case, the upper tier contractor terminated for convenience. It had a termination for convenience clause, essentially because the trial court found and uh, the they found a better price. So it was convenient uh, to terminate the sub. And they they said, we have unfettered discretion. And so ASA's SLDF fund entered an appearance and said, even though it says convenience, right, you have to read the covenant of fair dealing 
you know, implied covenant of fair, good faith and fair dealing into the application of even clauses that are very one-sided and say, we get to terminate you for convenience and you only get paid what you put into it. In this case, it was a flooring sub. It hadn't put anything into it, right? It, it ordered the materials, but it hadn't started. And while the project was going on, the upper tier was busy getting bid shopping. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it got hit. It got hit for the lost profits, um, you know, of the uh, and, and that was after the lower court had said, no, you don't. This, the highest court in Maryland said, yes, you do. You you, ha you can that covenant means you have to exercise it in good faith. So good faith in this context means the project funding's dried up. Something has happened external. Not you found a better price. Right. Yeah. So, and that's a case that, again, Maryland, but yeah, it applies everywhere, right? You can cite that whether you're in Texas mm -hmm. or you're in Florida or you're in Ohio. Um, you know, we the very first SLDF case was out, out in California. That that was where the Supreme Court of California found pay if paid clauses were unenforceable. Um and, and void is against public policy because essentially it was transferring the risk of payment of someone you're not in contract with, right? Like that, you know, a, a general contractor saying, unless I get paid by the owner, it doesn't matter that your work was great and you performed it and you supplied it and you paid all the money and effort into it. I don't have to pay you even though your contract's with me. And that's the, the California Supreme Court said no. Um, and then that Crosno case wound up, which was just uh, th four years ago, 2020, um, was where the, the the Court of Appeals in California cited that that case, right, the the mm -hmm. Safeco case, and said sureties can't rely on you know on a pay when paid clause because that functionally is the equivalent of of a pay if paid. So sureties have to honor their bonding obligations, um, you know, uh, regardless. So it's an example of one case leading to another case, right? That that extends into the bonding capacity and what they can rely on, and you know. There have been insurance cases. There, there's a case, um, sovereign immunity in Texas just recently. Uh, Brian Carroll did did the brief on that for ASA, uh, where Texas Southern University um, tried to prevent its contractor from being paid. Um, you know, citing sovereign immunity, saying where which is the principle that state entities or government entities can't be paid can't be sued unless they've agreed to it um which is used to protect against various torts and things like that but the 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 university there said we're a state entity we didn't agree to be paid to be sued for prompt payment act violations um and um and believe the lower court agreed with them, but the Texas Supreme Court agreed with ASA and our amicus brief that no, you don't get to uh, avoid Prompt Pay Act uh, by hiding behind sovereign immunity for that. You, know, you entered into the contract. The contract then is governed by state law. So, you know, th those are just three cases that run the gamut of that. You know, it includes pay if paid. It includes fair dealing and termination for convenience. It includes payment bond rights. Um, all those sorts of things are are some great results we've gotten all the way from the very first case in in ninety seven through to uh, you know the the Pepper Hamilton cases just a, a year ago um, you know and we continue to be able to to do that and and have even entered a, an appearance in a case in uh, the U S Supreme Court uh, in two thousand ten where um, the issue was uh, enforceability of a forum selection clause. And uh, though the court there said because the project in Texas was on a federal enclave, it was on a military base, um, they were going to allow enforcement of it. They preserved, there's there's uh, well in excess of, of 40 um, prompt, uh, statutes in states that say a form selection clause on a construction project that that requires you to litigate outside the, the place that construction has to is unenforceable. And that's a huge benefit to subs because you can imagine the leveraging you would have your local sub, you're doing your project in North Dakota, the contractor from Virginia, and it's for it's got a forum selection clause that says, hey, we don't pay you. You've got to come to our backyard in Virginia to sue us. If it's a state project or a private project, that will be unenforceable. If it's a federal project, 
you're out of luck, but it's a great case in, in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, that's an example of where amicus brief was was done at the U.S. Supreme Court level by the SLDF, too, and, and got, a, got a result that limited the impact of that case to the very narrow federal enclave and all, all otherwise preserved uh, in dozens upon dozens of states um, some great law that ASA had been behind in terms of invalid or uh, the problem of fairness and construction contracting acts. So the, the impact is clearly far and wide. I mean, uh, the, the, the work that, that you're doing is far reaching effects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest challenges that, that you face in providing legal support to contractors? I, I would say just education and awareness in our industry of our work and why why um, they should support it financially. We're really only limited by funding in our pursuit of these cases because of the incredible network of construction law experts that we have at our disposal um, in the Attorney's Council. They agree to financial caps that fall well below their standard rates to take on these cases because they believe in and understand the importance of the work that we're doing here. Um, I should I should also note that our attorneys are also our number one source of direct donations to the SLDF. Hmm. So they're they're truly putting their money where their mouth is. So they they get it. <laughs> I I guess that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Well, let's talk about the Attorney's Council a little bit. How does the Attorney's Council complement uh, the SLDF's work? Yeah, yeah. our Attorney's Council is a, a very dedicated and experienced group of construction law attorneys that join the Subcontractors Association to further our mission. So they provide us with integral information and resources and input for our membership on issues and legal matters that directly impact the community. Uh, we have over 150 council members in our database, um, and we host two in-person meetings every year, one in, in coordination with our sub-excel um, our sub -Excel conference that we do as an association-wide event, and then another that is just for our attorney's council. And then we also have virtual meetings throughout the year to discuss pending SLDF cases, contract document issues, and government relations issues. So they're, they're, they're part of our membership. Um, they're just attorneys that are specifically focused on construction law. And so we've got, they're, they're a very valuable resource for us uh, as, a, as an association. Is there a, um, a hierarchy? I mean, are, are all 150 people or attorneys on the attorney's council or is there, you know, they're available as needed or, is there, you know, a, a chair there, of the, we have, the council? We, we, yes, we elect mm -hmm. we elect a chair and a co-chair every year. The the co-chair is is um is sort of slated to take on the chairmanship for the next year. So we vote on that okay. each year and have and and rotate through our attorneys for, from a leadership perspective. Um beyond that, it's all all meetings and events are open to any any attorneys, um, whether whether they be chapter attorneys that uh, that are working specifically with our ASA chapters in some states, um, the it could be just a construction law firm that's been a part of the association for a number of years, um, in-house counsel for any of the our ASA members are welcome to join. So, um, and and of course we we do is particularly at the sub excel meetings, anyone is welcome to to join in our meetings. I just always tell them you know that they their eyes may glass over after the first hour of a uh, lawyer speak yeah. in these in these meetings, so they may. May or may not, not participate, but you're always welcome. To <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, like one of the things that's that's great about the attorneys' council meeting, right, is you 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 get some uh, you know some of the brightest minds that are focused on subcontractors' interests, legal minds. Um, in the room talking over what they're seeing and then at the same time working on and revisiting um, documents that ASA puts out and makes available for its subs like the subcontract uh, addendum and, and insurance addendums and things like that that um, really provide value to um, to ASA members and you know and if if 
if, if you if you are yourself looking for counsel, um, it's not a bad idea to to ask um, or look and check into whether or not you your your prospective counsel is a member of the ASA's attorneys council because you know it it gives a, a vehicle the members that are there um, to to speak about and to get ideas on you know what's coming up and how it's being handled in different courts and that allows. Um, that allows for really good representation um, from from you know, private representation for for the private clients of, of those members and from ASA's perspective the the work product that gets pushed out of that that is volunteered by those members of the attorneys council to ASA is is just top notch um, and um, you know and it's 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 a great thing that and resource that uh, that is reflective again of, of you know part part and parcel of what ASA provides and and um, and how it leverages the resources it has to to further its mission. That seems like a, a very powerful network. I mean, having uh, such a, a group of experts with knowledge um, and able to to bounce ideas off each other and collaborate uh, that's pretty formidable. But so we're mm -hmm. we're wrapping it up here. A um, couple more questions for you. Then, how do you measure success? Um, and the impact of, of the SLDF's work. And then the, the last one is uh, looking ahead, what are the future goals of the SLDF? I mean, I'd, I'd say we really like to see wins in the cases that we take yeah. up. Um, it's certainly a metric. Uh, we've <laughs> we've seen three wins just in the past year, uh, two in Texas and one in an Illinois case of uh, the issues at hand. I believe, um, and Eric can correct me if I'm wrong, involved prompt payment. There was a duty to defend claim in one and subcontractor immunity on the job site um, in, in the other. So we're proud of these accomplishments, you know, that, that, that we got the outcomes that we were looking for in those cases. And, um, and we're proud of the impact that ASA intervention had on the outcome. Excellent. And, you know, yeah, and and you know the success and impact, uh, you know, is is reflected in that one loss column. It's reflected in cases that then cite to those cases, whether they're in that state or elsewise. You know, as as direct precedent, or bi which would be binding precedent or or just persuasive. Um, and then it's it's it, it, and then the unseen impact is is much broader because what happens is in those states and in those. Uh, appellate districts, um, you know, the attorneys uh, on both sides know what the law is, and when it's pretty clear, um, you don't you don't make the argument. Um, now, what you do see is then you know it's it's a cat and mouse game, right? With with the, the, they then try to change the contract to weasel around it or get get as close as they can to to uh, to finding a way through it. But uh, it's a pretty resounding in when you have that success uh, at the trial court, there, there are ripple effects precisely because of the care that's taken at the front end that, hey, we want to enter into something that's got precedential impact. That's a big issue that has the ability to impact and influence contract negotiations, settlements along the way. So people never have to go to trial on it uh, and to perhaps influence courts in other jurisdictions when things do go to trial and the issue comes up. Um, you know, and, and again, you do have impact because there's certainly cases where, um, you know, where when you don't have, uh, when you get a decision that's that's not the way that you want, that that then does help fuel um, lobbying and other efforts um, as well that that can turn into productive um, legislation uh, that you might not have otherwise had if you didn't have a really juicy um you know fact pattern to be able to hang on to get the legislature's attention about um, something that wasn't fair um when in, in how it was resolved might have been right under the law then but it's just not fair right and that can influence decisions too right of course now shannon you mentioned earlier um that you have a meeting coming up or that you meet a couple of times a year When's your next meeting and what should people know about that? Our, our next meeting is going to be our fall attorneys council meeting. That is the meeting with our council members. We go to the, the, the home state of our chair, whoever the chair is at that point, and, and have a meeting where we just discuss 
all these issues, all these uh, subcontractor construction law issues and um, and and just sort of sit around for hours having those conversations that we were that we were talking about before. Uh, um, we go over resources that we can provide for the subcontractor community. Um, we have our subcontractors are, 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 I'm sorry, our attorneys are often involved in, in webinars and podcasts and educational efforts with, with the ASA as well. Um, so that our, that next meeting is going to be October 25th and 26th in the Atlanta area. There's more information on that also at our website at asaonline.com. Um, and that will be under the attorney's council. Um, you, you can find more um, and, and under events on, on our calendar of events. It will be there as well. So for, so if there are any members that are listening, maybe maybe there are attorneys listening that um, are not yet a part of our attorney's council. You can uh, reach out to to me at, at the association. My email address is soscar at asa-hq.com. And we'd be happy to add you to our distribution list um, and, and get you involved because we're we're always looking to to add new perspectives and and new states and and um, and new fresh faces to to our attorneys council meetings. Um, and and I guess I just wanted to say too, you know, looking ahead as far as future goals, uh, we we want to continue to expand our scope and get the word out regarding the work that we do in the subcontractor community and the construction uh, community. We're always looking for relevant appellate cases to take up and defend. And the more folks know about what we do, the more targeted case law we can take up to make an impact on behalf of the construction industry. So um, tell people about the SLDF, reach out to us for more information. Um, we, 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 we have get more folks involved and, and see more cases coming through. Well, thank you for that. Um, any closing thoughts, Shannon or Eric, either of you closing thoughts before we wrap it up here? None, none for me. I, I appreciate the time and uh, thanks for having us again. Those are my closing thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, this, that's um, what I figured. So. <laughs> Yeah, this was this was was great, and again, you know, the the hope is to to enhance, uh, you know, get get more cases in, get more people aware of it, um, and reaching out because, um, you know, because if we can if we can help, there's definitely a desire to do so, um, and uh, and a need for 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 people to to talk about, and become aware, and be thinking about. Uh, the task force and and the attorneys council and and what it all means and what it can mean to them as a business and to, to the industry as a whole. Well, I want to thank you both again for taking the time today. Uh, it's very instructive and educational hearing about all this. Uh, so I'm excited to share this with the members and frankly, anybody who's going to watch. So thanks again for your time. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, right. Mike. Yep. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the ASA podcast. For more subcontractor focused content, visit us at asaonline.com and facicares.org. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube.